good afternoon. My name is Brenda Tyndall. I am the executive director of the Harvard Museums of Science and Culture, where our mission is to foster curiosity and the spirit of discovery in visitors of all ages, enhancing public understanding of and an appreciation for the natural world, science, and human cultures. This mission in mind, it is my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's lecture sponsored by the Michael V. Diet Lecture Fund of the Harvard Museum of Natural History. One of the four research museums partnered with the Harvard Museums of Science and Culture. We are delighted to have David Marino Mateos with us tonight in person, if I might add, to discuss his research on how terrestrial ecosystems recover after having been disturbed by human activities. This is a very, very special event for us as it is our first hybrid event since the pandemic began two years ago. I am delighted to welcome our in-person audience as well as those who are joining us via the Zoom platform. Those of you joining online can submit questions at any time by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Your questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, David Marina Mateos, is an assistant professor of landscape architecture at the Harvard Graduate School of Design and an affiliate of the Department of Organismal and evolutionary biology in Harvard's Faculty of Arts and Sciences. He is a restoration ecologist interested in understanding the long-term recovery of ecosystems disturbed by human activities, and in particular, how long it takes for ecosystems to recover key attributes, such as interactions among soil organisms and plants. A better understanding of these processes could inform the development of new tools to enhance ecosystem restoration and increase ecological understanding in landscape architecture. David holds a PhD with honors from the Spanish National Research Council and the University of Alcala. Before joining Harvard, he held post at the Basque Center for Climate Change in Spain, at the French National Center for Scientific Research in Mount, in Mount Pelier, France, and at Stanford University and the University of California at Berkeley. David is an associate editor of the Journal of Applied Ecology and Ecological Restoration. He has authored more than 40 papers in scientific journals and books, including papers in Nature Communications, Nature, and Nature Ecology and Evolution. I am delighted to welcome David to the real and indeed the Zoom stage. Thank you, Brenda. It's 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 great. It's great to be here in person. It's it's fantastic. Thank you for this great introduction. It's made me feel a bird sometime when I hear that. So thank you very much. I'm gonna switch the presentation to to the stuff we're gonna be talking about today. Okay, so today we are basically going to talk about how one of the many ways we have to try to restore recovery ecosystems, basically recovering from the mess we are actually doing with ecosystems, with the earth in general. That in sometimes, in some way, I, I like I connect this with the tragic events that are happening in, in Eastern Europe, for instance, right now, the war. When I see these pictures of the war happening, what really kind of concerns me is not about the destruction that we are creating, it's about how much it's gonna to take to recover all this complexity that we are losing due to war and in natural ecosystems like and like <clears throat> this place in Greenland. So the issue is that what takes hours or weeks or a few months to destroy may take thousands of years to recover. So this is the case of this is one of our study cases, study cases in, in southwestern Greenland. As you probably have seen, there is something that highlights in this landscape, which is this kind of patch of weird plants here, this community 
is basically the leftovers of what it was a farm, a Norse farm in Greenland, abandoned sometime between 600 and 700 years ago. So the incredible thing about this is that the impact that was created by these people while burning the bushes here, like in a couple of weeks, is still visible. So you go here today and you see it, it's visible hundreds of, year after, of years after the impact. It's through this Antarctic ecosystem, which things go kind of slow, but it's amazing. We're talking about the time scale about we are talking that we are talking about. Here is what would be the ruins of the farm where the, usually the Norse farm, the Norse families would live. So what we're going to be talking today is how we can learn from these processes, from these kind of natural processes happening in the great ecosystems to actually apply for ecosystem restoration, but also in urban settings for landscape design and planning. We'll be focusing today about two basic concepts, which are time and complexity. And we'll walk through these concepts by understanding first how ecosystem, the process of ecosystem degradation and recovery. And we'll be doing that by understanding, by trying to understand how we can measure change in ecosystems, because ecosystems are complex systems where there's a whole lot of interactions and processes going on. So we want to have a better understanding of how to measure that complexity through, for example, understanding the interactions among the many organisms that are happening, that are coexisting in an ecosystem, and also the huge amount of genetic information that is in those uh, ecosystems. We'll walk through three case studies in a gradient of time since abandonment. We will visit first a mine in Spain abandoned 140 years ago. Then we'll jump to our Greenland places, these former all ancient Norse farms about 750 years ago, roughly speaking. And then we jump to a species that were used in agriculture and then were domesticated, well, more or less domesticated and then abandoned for over 1200 years by the pre-Columbian peoples in the Amazon. And finally, we'll look at the potential perspectives that we can learn from all this knowledge to apply in ecosystem restoration and, and urban ecosystem restoration too. So, uh, but first let's look at time. So time has also positive effects. So we have, we have been incredibly successful in increasing the life expectancy of, of people. In the 18th century, life expectancy was below 30 years. The last decade we have, we have, we have over 70 years of life expectancy on average in the world. There are places where things go much better. We've been very successful too in reducing poverty. So only in the last 40 to 50 years, we have decreased poverty from about 40% on average to about 10% only in 40 years. This is an amazing success as a, as a civilization, globally speaking. We've been, we've been also enormously successful in bringing democracy to people. So this is true democracy will be this green shading here. So in the forties, there was only 15% of the people living in true democracy, which is crazy to think about that. Today, we are over 60% of the people living in true democracy. The rest is, it's still unbelievable thinking that 40% of the people is not living in real, oh, sorry, in true democracies, which is kind of this big shading here, which includes all kinds of countries like Russia or China that have a whole lot of people. But all this comes to a price. And who do you think has paid the price for this enormous success? I mean, the response is probably obvious for most of you, it's nature. So we have been growing thanks that to nature. Every year we beat records in the amount of pollutants we put in the atmosphere, I mean, in the world, in, on earth, in general, not the atmosphere. I just put the example of the atmosphere because if we put all the CO2 that is producing climate change, we have already increased the temperature, the average temperature by 1.2 degrees Celsius, it's expected to be no less than 2.7 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. This is just one of the many impacts. Another of the major impacts is land use change. We have transformed over half of the land surface, mostly for agriculture, but also for urban development. It's still where many people we need to eat, so that makes sense. 
The thing is this has, and there are many other impacts. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but the thing is this array of impacts have important implications on nature. Some of them are just briefly described. One of the things that shocked me every time I read this, 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 this report every year is that we have lost over the last 40 to 50 years, about 60% of the vertebrates that exist on the planet. This, I mean, this number for me is crazy. And only in the last 40 years with thinking that most of the vertebrates, over 90% of them disappeared way before this time. We have also decreased biodiversity by 14% globally speaking. That means that no matter where we go on the planet, the biodiversity at each specific place is gonna be on average 14% lower than it was, let's say 500 years ago, which is not a long time from an ecological perspective. So in the end, basically what we are getting is we have actually tripled the extinction rates of um, all the species only in the last 100 years. So, um, but this base basically, and this is a process that this is still happening. This is kind of, kind of concerns me. So this destruction is already happening. So this is an extract of from the last uh, convention on biological diversity global outlook that was basically trying to evaluate how we were doing in, in, in reaching, in kind of addressing the 80 targets. The 80 targets is basically a series of goals that the convention was setting globally to solve the biodiversity crisis. After the evaluation happened 20 years after uh, it was kind of proposed, basically none of the 15 targets was actually achieved. And some of them were basically the same or worse than before, which is not very encouraging. Sorry about that. But one of the things that really strikes me is, is this, this graph. It's kind of a very simple, sorry, no, it's, sorry. It's, this graph is showing basically the time, the last few years. And uh, these are the millions of hectares that are deforested every year of primary forest, basically forest that has been understood until this time. So basically what we are seeing is that every year, we are still losing three to 4% of the primary forests. And this is basically a, a sing, the signature of the Bolsonaro presidency in the Amazon. So where deforestation increased dramatically. So essentially what we are getting is just a different kind of forest in the world. So we're losing primary forests, but when we degrade an all growth forest for whatever reason, logging, but mostly agriculture, what we're getting is just a younger forest. So the age of the forests on earth is decreasing every year. So how younger forest, and in most cases, the, actually the, the height of the trees is becoming more, smaller and smaller over the years. And this is due to an array of impacts that we have seen in this particular study. They were understanding the effects of temperature, drought, wildfire, or incident outbreaks, which are mostly driven by climate change, but also another impact that we saw before, land use change. Land use change is in itself the single most important impact that humans have made on earth so far much more important than climate change. This is a paper that came out literally a few weeks ago, which is the first time where they were trying to assess, basically to compare the effects of the most important threats on just a big database they were able to collect. They, were, they, they had um, uh, amphibians, birds, and mammals, but this would apply to probably most of the animals and most likely most of the plants. Basically, they collected information about all these uh, threats to these organisms, including like development, agriculture, energy production, transportation, all the way to pollution or climate change. And they compared all these threats to what they would call the baseline threat, which is geological events. That would be the, the, the threats that would happen if humans wouldn't be on earth. And basically this odds ratio is telling you how, what are the chances that a threat is happening caused by humans as opposed to not caused by humans. Basically, the more we go to the right, the higher the effect of the threat on the populations of, of these organisms. So what they found is that the threats caused by land use change alone, may mostly development, agriculture, and resource extraction, is three to, three to 10 times stronger than the effect of climate change. So this is basically, 
a, a, a reason to think that climate change is extremely important. We have to address it. By biodiversity loss is probably worse. I would have more unclear effects that is having climate change. So in the end, what I think is happening, sorry that this is go back to the place. I'm gonna try to hide it again. Hopefully it will stay. Uh, what basically, in my view, what we're doing is basically we are increasing the uncertainty of the, how we can actually rely on nature. Because all these degraded ecosystems are gonna be different. So we don't really know what are the functions that we are gonna be having, obtaining from these ecosystems in the future. For instance, are these ecosystems going to be as resilient as the ecosystem we used to have? Um, sorry, I don't know why this is not moving. Okay, the, it's gonna be our resilience are the ecosystems we used to have. And in the end, what are, what are the risks we are willing to assume due to environmental degradation caused by human development? So in the end, we are only ca always coming down to the same question. So this question has been for centuries in humans' minds. is how we can get a, to a compromise between development and nature. And if we, we've been actually doing really well in creating new alternatives to deal with that. We are great at creating green technologies like plastic, uh, like biodegradable plastics, renewable energies. We've made amazing progress in conservation of the remaining parts that are still, mm, let's say, well-preserved. And now we have this, let's say, not new, but emerging tool of restoration. We can actually, we have the opportunity to fix the things that we have been messing up. So now aware of the importance of restoration, it's been a whole lot of strategies over the last 10 years that have been emerging all over the place here in the European Union. There are now actually a new restoration law being approved in the European Union that affects every country with a strong legal commitments to do it. We have the sustainable development goals from the United Nations that rest where restoration is also coming up as strongly as one of the most important tools to achieve those goals in at least four of them out of the 17, I think. Then we have the, what we mentioned before, the AG targets that are actually not binding, but they are act strongly pushing countries to bring restoration up in their agendas. And there are independent initiatives like the New Declaration on Forests, which is a global platform of 32 countries that are aiming to restore 350 million hectares in the next 20 years. Well, actually that was before, now it's in the next 10 years. So, and all these kind of global strategies have crystallized in, in the new United Nations Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, which is a huge strategy that uh, includes every single country with the United Nations, which is actually pretty much every single country on the planet, which is actually trying to put restoration on the top of the political agendas in every country in the world. But, and this is all wonderful. I think this is a great momentum. This is all great, but sometimes when I look at the projects that the on the ground projects that they call restoration, things kind of get a little bit concerning because you basically are looking at how people is planting trees, but planting trees is not restoration. Obviously planting trees is a whole different thing that helps in restoration. So to evaluate how, so my, my concern is that in some way, I'm uncertain if we can achieve these wonderful goals. And the thing is what we can do to actually achieve them. So we did a, a glo several global evaluations on the performance of restoration. This is one of them. Here we evaluated 3000 restored ecosystems all over the globe to understand how much they have recovered after they were restored. So this graph is, is quite simple, basically. So you have time here and you have any ecosystem attribute. It could be like number of species, carbon in the soil, denitrification, any attribute. So this is the stage where the ecosystem is not degraded and disturbance starts. The, the attribute basically drops or change, changes and then it, the disturbance ends and then recovery starts happening. So basically what we did here is comparing all these different stages of recovery with a reference state to see how much less or how much, how different it was from the recovery process. This is what we call the recovery debt, which is the amount of, uh, let's say a species or uh, carbon in soils 
the the um, the loss that we have caused during the recovery process, even in the case that when the restoration the the ecosystem has been restored. What we found here is that restored ecosystems have, on average, half of the animals and plants present in the place. They have about one third less diversity and forty percent less functionality. And so on. But the question that remains here is time. So because we tried to actually see how these, these parameters change through time, but the database wasn't, let's say, good enough for, for multiple kind of analytical reasons. And we didn't understand how really time happened here. Because what we kind of see is that things tend to not recover completely, even after, after long periods of time. There's been some efforts to try to address this question. This one, one of the first ones where they compile a, a series of chrono sequences in Amazonian forests. So chrono sequence is basically a series of forests that have been degraded at different times, let's say in history, for instance, think of a forest that was degraded 300 years ago, another was degraded 200 years ago, and another one degraded was degraded 100 years ago. So you can actually build and a space for time substitution of these forests to try to reconstruct more or less a recovery trajectory. And then you compare those with undegraded forests, undisturbed forests. So these people here uh, did this, used this approach to first understand the recovery of the biomass. That is how much plant tissue there is in a tropical forest after it's been recovered. So here's the same graph pretty much. We'll be looking at the same graph most of the time. So here is time, and here is basically the biomass compared to a reference, which is 100%. This would be basically the, the biomass you find in a reference in an undegraded primary forest. So they found like about, let's say it's 50 to 60, no, it's like 60 years biomass recovered. Then they did the same with the number of species. Again, they found that about 60 years, more or less, the number of species recovered. But when they looked in the more, let's say, complex ecosystem attributes, like who was there, like what are the species that are actually living in these places, they found a completely different story. So after a hundred years, things didn't really recover like pretty much. And this is one of the tricky things. The tricky thing is, is it depends on what you measure. You may think the recovery has, has happened or it may not happen. And this is what we've been trying to respond uh, with another study where we have compiled a whole lot more of chrono sequences, over 100 chrono sequences from forests from, from all over the world. And this is a new graph that Veronica, who is sitting back there, just sent me this morning <laughs> and on kind of a similar approach, but in a more, more complete perspective. So each of these small lines is the, the a chrono sequence. And then we basically model how these current sequences were behaving all together through time. And look mostly here at the time scale we are talking about. We are talking about 300 years. And what this, and we looked at the abundance of organisms, the diversity of a species, then a species similarity one and two is basically measures of how similar are the species in the degraded ecosystem versus the reference ecosystem. Okay, and we also look, look at sub functions like the carbon cycling or the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus in the soil. As you can see, kind of regardless, the parameter we are looking at after 150 years, things were pretty much like not recovered, especially when you look at as a species composition. Basically, and if we go in the, those data for which we have like longer time series, uh, the carbon still needs some time tweaking because it's it's kind of a new, but I want to just show you these really cool results. So everything leads to it, it's recovering, great, but the time scale we are talking about is hundreds of years. So hopefully we'll come up with some numbers to try to understand how long it's actually recovering, how long it actually recovery takes, but we are talking about hundreds of years. So hopefully, sorry, so hopefully we'll come up with a specific number, but it's actually not surprising that recovery takes for so long. Look at this picture. So this is a primary forest in the highlands of Costa Rica. An amazing, an absolutely amazing place. So this tree is over 400 years old. It's like 60 meters tall. And look at the immense diversity that happens in like, I, like we're talking about like a hundred square meters. It's like we're talking about hundreds of species, probably thousands when you're looking into the soil hundreds of plant species. 
So if you, in one day, you can turn this into this, like literally in one single day, this is like war. So you destroy everything and everything goes away. So what do you expect? How much, how long that's gonna take for all this complexity to recover? So one of the questions that we have is like, if we wanna bring this back to what we had before, tricky, but hopefully possible at some time scale, what is what we need to do? And based on our previous results, what is actually hampering the recovery of ecosystems when, when they are restored? So with this idea, we did another global evaluation of the different factors that are affecting ecosystem restoration. We compile data from over 14,000 studies on ecosystem restoration, basically trying to understand what are the main factors that are affecting ecosystem recovery. We came up with these 25 factors that were identified by all these many studies are the most important, the most important sorry, factors affecting ecosystem restoration, either as barriers for restoration or as booster of restoration. I am only going to talk about the first three that we found. The most important ones is the restoration techniques used in restoration. Basically, what do you need to do to restore one specific system under certain environmental conditions? The second is the performance assessment and evaluation, which is basically how do you evaluate the recovery of that ecosystem? So how do you know the ecosystem is actually recovering? So what are the parameters that you're looking at? And finally, the temporal scale is like, you need to use the right temporal scale in restoration to actually restore ecosystems. As we have seen, restoration may take maybe a long process. The problem is that restoration as it's seen today is basically like a one-time action. So you go to the place, you restore it, and then you leave. Occasionally, there are some monitoring that usually lasts for less than five years, which compared to the time scales we are talking about is like pretty much like nothing. So in the end, all these, very, all these factors were, sorry, they were, they were ranked in terms of the importance. Basically, the importance was based on the number of times that was kind of identified as a problem or as a factor, not a problem, as a factor, then the geographic range of the studies and also the temporal lapse that was covered by the studies. Basically, what this is telling us is that we haven't been able yet to find where are the restoration techniques, what are the parameters we need to measure, and where are the temporal scales adequate to restore ecosystems. So these are, these are still the main factors limiting ecosystem recovery. So we need to focus on, uh, so we need to focus, sorry, we need to understand more how ecosystems work, the scales at which they work, and the complexity of the ecosystems to identify the right restoration techniques, as we will see in a few slides. And one of the things, one of the approaches that we are trying to use to deal with this kind of, let's say, reduced efficiency or reduced performance of, of restoration is on this focusing on ecosystem complexity. And we're gonna use this case to understand that this is a forest, uh, and a schematic representation of a forest. Each of these green shapes are the trees. Each of, the, each of these kind of weird shapes here are fungi, fungal individuals. So individuals that live underground that they spread in, through the mycelium, that they spread like mycelium over underground and connect with the trees. So these are mycorrhizal fungi. As you probably know, mycorrhizal fungi are organisms that attach to the roots of the trees. And then there is an exchange of nutrients between the tree and the fungi. So they both are happy and grow happily for a long time. This graph is telling you how each of these trees is connected to each of these individual fungi and how these individual fungi are actually uh, uh, linking different trees in the whole forest. For instance, this tree was linked through the mycelium network to over 60 trees in this forest. So this network is actually a way that trees have to share nutrients and actually to provide all kinds of different signals, like chemical signals to, uh, to communicate with other trees. So the thing is once, we, and this is a super simplified version of a forest. So you should think that this is just one species of tree and two species of mycorrhizal fungi. In a regular temperate forest, you find like six, well, something between three and eight, three species, and usually something between 70 to 100 mycorrhizal species. So this is basically the most simple way to see a forest. 
but this is the kind of things that we need to understand to understand how forests are actually working and how we can restore them. So the questions we are trying to address is how do we measure this complexity and how we measure the change of this complexity through time. And we're gonna focus in, we'll be focusing on the structure of interactions between trees and soil microbes and how this produces functions in the ecosystem as we will see, for instance, the carbon pathways, where are more efficient. We are gonna be looking also on how the, on, on to the evolutionary response of organisms to degradation and recovery. So think that if you go to an ecosystem, like anyone like this one, uh, and you kind of destroy like the picture we saw before, you are actually breaking of those interactions, but you are also stopping evolution to happen. So it's gonna be a whole new array of circumstances that's gonna change how its ecosystems are gonna evolve. So one of the things that we hypothesize that may be happening, we'll see in a few slides, is that the evolutionary potential, which is how a species can adapt to new changes, for instance, climate change, uh, how this evolution potential is, is lost th due to the impact and how it could be recovered. And the second question is how these two processes, how long is it going to take to actually recover to these two processes? So to, to respond to these questions, we are using, uh, we have two hypotheses. The first hypothesis is, is Basically, the more complex the metric we are using to understand recovery, the longer it takes. So let me explain you what I mean by that. So this is the same graph we've been seeing over and over. So this is time. This is the metric of an ecosystem. So this is disturbance that happens. The metric, it kind of, it kind of uh, drops and then it recovers. Each of these dots is one species, let's say a plant species or an animal species or a plant and an animal species. And we see that this is just the number of species. This is the identity of those species. This is how those species interact. And then this is how different groups of organisms interact in the ecosystem. Basically, what we hypothesize is that the more complex the metric, the more it would take to recover and think it in this way. So think if a place that is like the forest we saw before, it's completely degraded. There is nothing left. And so the species need to arrive to these places to have dispersal limitations that really make things difficult for many of those species that took like hundreds of years to get to the place. Then you have the other species with, with which the first species in Iraq that also need to arrive in a synchronous way. And they have to come in enough amounts for those interactions to actually happen and be stable through time. And then the functions that emerge from those interactions, like for instance, pollination can emerge. So there's a lot of things that need to happen for this complexity to reassemble. Uh, to reassemble through time. And this one study that was using this approach uh, that was published a few years ago, they were trying to understand how recovery happens in a, let's say, more or less simple ecosystems. They were meadows in the Netherlands that were abandoned a year before the study, 15 years and 30 years. They basically got samples from the soil and they sequenced the DNA of whatever it was. And these are, for instance, all the bacterial communities, and these are uh, the red ones. The blue ones are all the fungal communities and all these other organisms. So where they've, and the links is basically the interaction between, let's say, this fungi and this bacteria, and the size of this link is basically how strong is that interaction, how many times you find that interaction happening in that meadow. As you can obviously see through time, the number of links increases dramatically, but what also increases dramatically is the size of a strong, I mean, the, the strength of these links. So basically, it's like the strength of these connections grows through time, which is making these networks in the later stages more resilient to change. And specifically, they were becoming more efficient in using carbon, which is the amazing thing. They were able to compare complexity with ecosystem functions. The recovery of complexity actually helps the recovery of ecosystem functions. Uh, and that was basically because bacteria is bad at using carbon and fungi is good at using carbon. So this functional recovery is what basically is driving the, is the consequence of the recovery of this, of this complexity. Our second hypothesis is basically based on what I mentioned before. So when you degrade an ecosystem and you stop evolution, you are actually, what you are doing in most of the cases is reducing genetic diversity. Genetic diversity is simply put, the amount of genetic information that organisms have in their DNA. 
And genetic diversity is important because the more information you have in your DNA, the more tools you have to cope with disturbance, with change, with climate change or pollution. So you want to have populations with a reasonably high amount of genetic diversity. It's not necessarily like you have the highest, but a reasonably good amount of genetic diversity. So we hypothesize that once ecosystems have uh, lost some of the genetic diversity, as is shown in this study here, that is showing the uh, gradient of impact. So this is less impact and more impact, except for cities where there's a huge influx of kind of um, all kinds of species coming in and out from the system. There's an artificially induced high genetic diversity. If you look in, in more natural ecosystems, you increase uh, genetic diversity as you have less disturbance. So we are hypothesizing that we could actually reverse this trend. What, what about if we restore ecosystems? Are they going to recover all this genetic diversity at this adaptive potential? And this is what we are trying to test. This is very preliminary stages yet. I will show you a, a, one slide on what we're try, trying to do. So basically, we're trying to test these two hypotheses in our system, which is basically any forest in the world that has the right conditions. We are looking at the interaction between plants soil and soil microorganisms and how these interactions below ground, like here we are just putting like a couple of uh, mycorrhizal fungi attached to the roots, some soil insects, and how these interactions are actually affecting function above ground, like for instance, resistance to herbivory. So this is the next step that we will do. So this is kind of the ideal, uh, the ideal project, but we are mostly now focused on this, on how this is actually recovering through time in the three study cases that we saw at the beginning. So the first study case is uh, this mine in Spain. So this is actually a big hole. I'm sitting here, I'm just at the edge of the cliff. And this is basically a hole that was digged for a long time until 140 years ago when it was abandoned. Today it's covered by a mature, kind of recently mature forest of European beech. So here what we do is we collected samples from the trees, from the roots, from the, from the roots of these trees to understand who was actually in interaction and interacting with this, with this forest. In, in this case, we only have like one species of tree, which made things easier, probably less interesting, but it was easier to identify the changes. And what we found is shown here. So this graph in a, it's a, it's a simple way to put how different are the communities, that is the communities of fungi that are associated to trees inside the mine and outside of the mine. So as you can see, the farther they are these ellipses, the more different are these communities. Each of these dots is actually the trees. So this is basically telling us that mines are similar and trees outside of those mines are not similar, basically. After 140 years, this is the, 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 the crazy thing. We are talking about a long time period that is showing us that the species are still different. In this graph, this graph is showing you that the species are mostly unique to either the mines or outside of the mine. This is just a, a very short list. We, we got a lot more mycorrhizal fungi. And all the ones that are in squared in red are the ones that are shared between the two of them. As you can see, there's just a tiny bit of them that are actually shared between the two, the two, the impacted versus the non-impacted, the impacted versus the non-impacted forests. And most of these are basically the super generalists that you can find anywhere. So basically it's telling you that the species are still being extremely different after 140 years in these forests. Now we're gonna jump to the Greenland project. In Greenland, and in Greenland is a, a big island what was kind of colonized by the Norse sometime in the 10th century, all the way up to the mid 15th century. And then as I mentioned before, they all basically died. And this is, this is, I like this, this is a beautiful uh, representation of the island. It's actually, this is actually from a study that was trying to understand the loss of ice in, from the ice cap in, in Iceland. So this red uh, colors indicating places where there is a lot of ice loss, but we don't really care about that. So I just wanna see the, this beautiful picture showing what we are working here in the lower tips, which are the most habitable places um, that existed there. So we went to this, a series of these farms, there is like a bunch of them. I think it's, I, 
something of over 400 farms that are uh, that happened that existed in the, in in Greenland. So we there go there. We compare the former hayfields, as you can see here, is still visually identifiable, and then we have the non-disturbed places. We collected samples of plants and roots and soils and see what was different between these two places that you can see visually after so long in, in, in many places. Well, the first thing we found is that the amount of plants was, the amount of plant species was the same. Not surprising compared to, compared to other studies, but when we really look deep into the ecosystem, we found a very different picture. So the first thing we found is that degraded places here had a lot more nitrogen and phosphorus than reference and disturbed places. So nitrogen is the blue one and phosphorus is the orange one. This is a legacy of ancient agriculture in, in, uh, uh, that was done by the Norse all this time ago. So this is maybe creating a kind of this feedback loops that perpetuate an alternative state in this ecosystem that is preventing it to change. But this has important consequences. One of them, which is one of the most important findings that we are getting from this disturbance and recovery studies is that in reference places, we had a lot more mutualistic interactions. And in disturbed ecosystems, we had a lot, a lot more pathogenic interactions. So mutualistic interactions are the interactions, for instance, that happen within the plants and the fungi where they share nutrients, they are all happy, and that's great. Pathogenic interactions is kind of obvious. You all know what a pathogenic interaction is. So by degrading ecosystems, we are losing mutualism, which is benefit for more, more species, and we're increasing kind of uh, pathogenic interactions. And this is something that's been found in other ecosystems. And still, it's a, it's a hypothesis that this is actually that happens all over the place. But this is something really interesting that we now keep exploring. When we actually link the fungi, all these different kinds of fungi with the plants, we build and we built these networks. This network is actually quite simple. So basically we have here, each of these rectangles is a plant species. The larger the rectangle is, the more, uh, um, the more abundant this species is. And the same happened with all the fungi. Each of these rectangles is a fungal species, let's say. It's not exactly a species, but more or less. We have reference places and we have disturbed places. As you can see here, we have a lot less species, actually half of them than in reference places. Basically, what we're making is that these, sorry, the connections are basically what we found that this species was actually interacting with this family. I forgot to mention that. And what we found is that basically networks in degraded places were more vulnerable to further change. So in some way, they were less resilient. So by degrading ecosystems, we are creating less resilient ecosystems. The next step we want to work on this is, is basically trying to identify what are the species that have the most important ecological roles in these communities. Using the example of Greenland, for example, is what are those species that have the most links with the community? And actually using them as meta community hubs. A meta community hub is, is again, it's kind of a fancy name for a simple concept. It's like who is the most important in this community in term, from an ecological term? The one that is providing more nutrients, the one that is interacting with more other factors, the one that's giving food to more species. So, a species that are having really important ecological roles. So, once we identify this meta community hub species, what we want to do is make sure that we have those species coming from populations with high adaptive potential. And I'll go back to this, I'll go back to this in a bit, which is the Brazilian braid. We are trying to test this hypothesis. The hypothesis that we have species with high genetic diversity are those that have higher adaptive potential that can recover with the Brazil nut tree. The Brazil nut tree is a species that was in harvested for by the pre-Columbian people for a very for thousands of years actually and many of those populations have been abandoned so they were harvested for a long time and they were abandoned the spaniards came there most of them died in the last 500 years but it's been also previous wars and pandemics and all the problems in different places of the amazon that have left populations of brazil nut trees abandoned at different times so what we're gonna go do is go what we're actually starting to do is going to these places and see what happens when you abandon this crop 
after a long time? Are they actually recovering all this genetic diversity that was lost due to the selection for having been more productive? And this is the hypothesis. We'll see if this is actually happening. In this particular case, what we are going to do is using whole genome sequencing. Probably you have heard of whole genome sequencing. Genomics is changing everything in science, in life science mostly. And whole genome sequencing is basically a way that is becoming cheaper and cheaper to sequence the whole genome of a population. This is basically like the whole genome, most of the genome of a population. So you can actually look in this genome where are the functions that were lost due to the domestication process and how these functions are recovering in these different populations. So you can actually, if you identify those functions that were lost in, in those populations, you can actually go to the landscape and find populations that have the functions that you want. And these functions could be, okay, where are the populations that are more resistant to drought? Where are the, the, the populations that are more resistant to pests? And, and then you can use those species actually in restoration and landscape architecture too. So one of the things we are trying to do now is actually how you can bring this meta community hub approach with populations with high adapting potential, which will make the most resilient ones into the cities, not only in restoration. And how can, how can we actually create the structures in the city to, pro, to facilitate the communication between trees kind of, let's say, below the streets and the sidewalks. So you can have healthier, tree, healthier trees that are adapted, especially to climate conditions that are changing, especially heat increases a lot with climate change in the city, uh, in the cities, as you probably know. So what are the structures that we need to build in cities to allow for this communication to happen using these specifically selected species and individuals in, that have an increased resilience? So I want to wrap up with all this large amount of ideas for restoration and landscape design by basically pointing out the main ideas that we have been going through today, which are basically tame and complexity. So the, the, the first idea is recovery take a whole lot of time. So the short impacts that happen overnight may take centuries to recover. And then we need to understand how this recovery is happening by understanding how complex are our systems. We are focusing specifically on these interaction networks. So how organisms in an ecosystem interact and how these interactions reassemble through time and how this is having effects on the functions of the ecosystems as we have seen, how we can change again from these more pathogenic interactions towards more mutualistic interactions. And then how we can actually see if we can recover the genetic diversity lost to degradation in, in via, lost to degradation via uh, ecosystem restoration. And then how we can bring this into action by, for instance, what the ideas that we, we are presenting, I'm presenting here today is the idea of using these meta community hubs, again, a species with extremely important ecological roles that are coming from populations that actually have the most adaptive potential, which are in the end, the most resilient to all the global changes and the impacts and the stressor, the stressors that are increasing every year on, on the ecosystem. So in a way, it's just a way, it's just a way to actually restore ecosystems in a faster way, so the ideal is to not to need to wait hundreds of years. So we can actually restore ecosystems in a shorter time period, but also create an ecosystems, both in the natural and in the built environments that are more resilient because they are coming from populations with higher potential to adapt to changes. And I'm gonna leave it here. So I'm ready for questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>